Hey everyone, so it's time to talk about Gundam Battle Operation Code Theory. This week I beat Volume 1 of Code Theory, consisting of its first five episodes. Yes sir, that is correct. Episodes. Code Theory is a groundbreaking hybrid Gundam anime series with playable video game sections. Now, to change things up from my usual format, I am going to put down this extremely Gundam related horror here to ask me stupid obvious questions. Hello, MB. Hello, Haro. MB, let's play Macho. No, not right now, Haro. I have to do a stupid video game review. Alright, to start off with the free to play Gundam Battle Operation series. I first played Gundam Battle Operation 1 back on the PS3 when it first came out in 2012 because it came out why I was living in Japan, and I got super into it. I was very, very impressed at the time because this was one of the first Gundam games where you could custom paint your Gundam and also walk out of the Gundam and play as a pilot with a gun in a spacesuit. Now, this was technically the second game to do this. The first one was an impossible to find Xbox game, Gundam game that came out of nowhere. But even in Japan, I could never find or play that game. Anyway, so the first Gundam Bell operation was really, really fun at first. In the first, GBO game, you could only play the game for free three times a day. If you wanted to play the game more than three times a day, you had to choke up some Japanese yen to buy more lives like this was a fucking 1980s arcade machine. Now a lot of free to play games use this model nowadays, but back in 2012 when GBO came out, this had never been done before and for most people it was shocking and disgusting. So literally the only people who bought lives for this game were the people who were Japanese and highly addicted to it. And for everyone else, you could only play the game three times a day, and then the game would shut itself off. So you couldn't really get addicted to the game unless you paid up. Therefore, because that's the way it was, it didn't take long before this pay-to-play model killed the game, and then no one was playing it, paid lives or not. Even if you were paying for lives, there wasn't anyone to fight, because everyone got sick of only being able to play three times a day. So when the PS4 finally came around, the game was relaunched as Gun and Battle Operation 2. Instead of the stupid live system, you could now play the game as much as you wanted to, except you would only receive rewards the first three times a day you played. On top of that, the second game got a full American release and a full English translation. So I was trying to avoid playing this game at first, but all my Gundam friends peer pressured me in and sucked me back into it, and the game also gave a very generous starting bonus when I first came out. So I played Gundam Battle Operation 2 for about a year straight. Now what happened in this first year is, very early on I pulled the GPO2 Faisalis and I got extremely extremely good at playing with the Faisalis. I somehow ranked myself up into the top tier of players, got all the trophies in the game, and when I had all the trophies in the game I decided enough was enough, so I stopped playing it. Now I know that after I stopped playing it they eventually added suits from Zeta, Double Zeta, and Shards Counterattack to the game, and I actually booted up this week for the first time in years just to make sure my save data was still there, just in case it had any effect on Code Fairy, but logging into GBO2 got me a free pull that got me a Kugelay. Now, if I want to get back into it, well, I don't. But by and large, I'm done with GBO2, so let's just talk about Code Fairy now. So, Bandai has been incredibly bad at describing what exactly Code Fairy is. Maybe it's laziness on their part, or maybe they're just bad at figuring out a way to explain it to people. So let's go over some basics. And these Code Fairy and Expansion Pack for GBO2. No, Haro. Code Fairy is not an expansion pack or a DLC for GBO2. Except it has this feeling like it kinda is. It's a standalone game, so you don't need to have played GBO2 first. But if you have played GBO2 already, you're going to go all the controls and you're going to have a much easier time playing it. So it doesn't connect to GBO2 at all then. No, 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 Haro, that's not true either. Now, I haven't fully figured out exactly how much these games synergize, but your accomplishments in Code Fairy seem to definitely maybe give you shit in GBO2 later. It feels like Code Fairy is the real game that GBO2 is based on, and GBO2 is actually the multiplayer mode for Code Fairy, which they gained out for free two years ago. How much does it cost? So, Code Fairy has three different pricing plans, which is kind of ridiculous. Either you buy each volume for $20 a volume if you want to take it slow and decide if you like the game or not, or you can just pony up the cash up front and buy the whole game, all three volumes, for $50 and save $10. There is also a super deluxe package for $60 that I foolishly bought, 
which is another $10 more expensive. The same cost as buying all three volumes individually, but it gives you some extra crap in GBO2, which I didn't realize. And the other thing it does is it gives you access to the game three days early, which is cool, I guess. Anyway, I probably should have bought the $50 one. That's probably the best bang for your bucks. The deluxe one is good, though, if you are actively playing GBO2. But if you're just curious about the game, you can always try buying the volumes individually. Just know that if you like the game, you're going to have to pay $60 to get all three volumes if you want to finish it. Also, I really wish this game would have gotten a physical release, but apparently that's not on the cards right now. So screw it, I just bought it online. How does the game play? Oh, okay, so... I guess I'll take a second to touch on the gameplay. The gameplay in Code Fairy is essentially the same gameplay as GBO, but with some small tweaks because it's single player. Since GBO was a multiplayer shooter, Code Fairy involves more fighting against vehicles, and since you can't communicate with your teammates, you have to control them with some basic tactic controls. Now despite that, it has a lot of brand new maps. A lot of these new maps are loosely based on existing GBO maps. You're going to see reminiscent architecture, reminiscent items. But the point being is if you liked playing GBO2 and you were good at GBO2, you're instantly good at playing this game. Now, this game also has maintenance breaks like GBO2 had, but all you have to do in these is apply items to your Zakus and otherwise just listen to the girls' chit chats as they prepare to launch into battle. Now, if you mess up on a mission, you will get a game over if Alma dies. But generally, if you capture points, capturing points will restore your health and let you fix both her Zaku and the other girl's Zakus. And it's all about just continuously surviving with your gorilla tactics. Helena and Mia can die infinitely, but if they're alive, they can use pilot skills, which are really useful. Helena has a pilot skill that raises everyone's defense, and Mia has a super broken pilot skill that heals everyone on a map. Of course, that's assuming Mia's Zaku half cannon has not been destroyed when you try to use it. Okay, cool. So what is the story? What happens in this game? Oh man, Haru. Okay, so this is where it gets really, really crazy. So Code Fairy is a hybrid 15 episode anime series with video game segments. It's basically a Gundam anime, except when the girls get into their Zakus, you're playing a video game. So. Previous Xeon based video games have followed such ragtag mobile suit teams such as the Midnight Fenrir, the Invisible Knights, the Chimera Corps. Code Fairy follows the Noisy Fairies, an all ladies MS team consisting of three bombshell teenagers, the energetic, wacky main character Alma Sterner, the team Brainiac, the adorable chubby glasses girl Mia Brickman, and the super strong alternative girl with the tattoos Helena Hagel. They all serve under two Xeon commanders, the spacey but calm Killy Gallet, and the strict commander Barbara, who is just all about getting stuff done. They also have a middle-aged alcoholic mechanic named Ermelia. So like I said, the girls are a prototype Zaku team. Alma has a state-of-the-art high-mobility ground Zaku, which is essentially an early production type goof, but it's still Zaku. Elena has an extremely rare Zaku 2 sniper type, which I've never seen before. And Mia gets saddled with the hunk of junk Zaku half cannon, which is unfortunately just a Zaku 2 that has been repaired with Zaku cannon parts. So what is the actual story of the game then? What happens? Okay, story spoilers from here on out. Spoilers, spoilers. You should stop watching the video now if you're actually intending to play the game. Code Fairy. Every episode starts off with some crazy girl shenanigans, followed by a team training exercise where you learn some of the basic GPO tactics, and after the first mission, you learn extremely advanced GPO tactics. Some of these tactics are actually so advanced that even though I played GPO for a year, I didn't know of them. Now, after that, you have your mission, and usually after that, it goes back to another anime cutscene where there are more crazy girl shenanigans. Wait, why are there so many shenanigans? Okay, Code Fairy is really weird. Like, if I had to sum it up, like, when you're inside the Zakus, everything gets very serious and there's a tone kind of like the OAFMS team. Alma and Helena are badasses, but Mia, meanwhile, is just trying her hardest not to die. How to do that as efficiently as possible. But when the girls are not in their Zakus, this anime is fucking weird. It's suddenly a slice of life girl shoujo anime. Like, the girls are holed up in a very large mansion they call Tiranog, 
located somewhere in the American Midwest. I want to guess it's in either Nevada or Utah from the dialogue and location clues. The anime also syncs up precisely with the original Gundam anime, albeit on a slightly faster timeline. The story starts off at pretty much the same time the original Gundam starts. By episode 3, Garmazabi is dead. We see Giran's Sig Zeon speech, which is just straight up the video from the 1979 Gundam anime, which clashes with this art style so hard. Kelly mourns Garma because she thinks he was too innocent for the war. Also, in episode 3, we're introduced to the main bad guy rival. Her name is Lilith. She's an insane cyber new type lady on steroids. She's a GM pilot, and she is definitely going to create a problem for these ladies. Now, this game follows some very traditional Gundam video game traditions. So, there's definitely an Ifrit for the girls in the card. And in the last stage, Lilith shows up in a custom Gundam Pixie. In episode 4, the Federation rolls out the standard GM with the beam weaponry, and the girls instantly get completely wrecked. Especially Miyazaku Half Cannon, it gets completely destroyed by beam weaponry because, again, it's the worst unit on the team. It's pretty much being held together with duct tape. And yet, despite that, I'm really looking forward to playing as it in the post game. Now, the fairy unit really only survives based on the fact that these girls are masters of guerrilla warfare and teamwork. Now, when I finished episode 4, I wasn't so far satisfied with this game slash anime. I was very, very happy that this is as close that we've ever come to to getting an all-female-led Gundam series, because all those Fujiyoshi got to inappropriately Oyeago Gundam boys for years, and it was about time I finally got some sexy Gundam ladies to lust after. But the first four episodes of Code Fairy have this weird disconnected vibe. Like, the overall vibe is like... We got these wacky girls living in this boarding house, but actually it's an abandoned mansion that Zeon captured when they conquered the United States of America. Like, the anime layout is so fucking weird because it's very structured like like a cutesy girls anime, like k -On. Like, the girls do dumb cutesy shit, but then instead of like, practicing their musical instruments and then playing like concerts, they practice using their zakus and then they go out and kill a bunch of men. Then they come home, think nothing of it, and do more cute shit like making cupcakes and whatever. Like, even though it's set in the One Year War, the most absolute horrible war in Gundam, these girls are fucking living in a bubble being moe blobs. Like, they're making Halloween cupcakes, they're not really coming to terms with the fact that every day they almost die and they murder dozens of men. Mia is the only one on the team concerned with not dying, and rightly so since they saddled her with the worst Zaku in the unit. Honestly, if I could have had anything from this game, I would have loved for it to take on a tone more like the way the Shrike team was in like the V Gundam anime, just without Uso. Like, do you remember how awful it was when Kate was fried alive by a beam saber in Victory Gundam? Or that traumatizing like moment when Mahalia died in a fire? Or how Uso's mother was popped like a ketchup packet, and then Uso handed her dismembered bloody dripping corpse to Oh my god! I have to stop remembering V Gundam! The Gundam was horrible! Careful Uso, bikini women are trying to shoot you. I'm not Uso. Okay, anyway, after that, I finally reached episode 5 of Code Fairy. I reached that today, and that was honestly the biggest game changer in the game. Episode 5 finally made Code Fairy everything I wanted and more. Like, the first three episodes were just completely easy, like, for kids. Episode 4 was a little bit tough, I think I died once, but in 5, 5 was the nightmare stage. And 5 really wrapped up the first act very well. So, in episode 5, what starts out happening is Operation Odessa happens before the episode, and Makuve runs away and pulls his forces out of the earth. So the Norsey Fairy team gets completely cut off resource-wise. So the tone of the girls instantly starts nosediving. They kind of know at this point that they've lost the war, and now they're stuck on Earth playing a survival game. Now, the girls do drop, though, that even though they've been cut off, they still have an E-Freed apparently coming to help them. Because of tradition. Now, Mia makes an interesting discovery that the Hildorfer from Mobile Suit Gundam Igloo is laying dead and abandoned very nearby in the Arizona desert and has not been touched since its pilot was killed. So, Mia comes up with a very interesting and not completely revealed plan that they are going to salvage the Hildorfer. 
I have no idea how this is going to play out, but I'm so intrigued. She says she's primarily interested in salvaging the cannon, and I think there's a really good chance that she either fully repairs the Hildorfer, she might even upgrade it into a Zamel, or maybe she'll make something brand new and crazy in between. Anyway, since the Zaku half cannon has finally been killed by GMs, Mia finally gets an upgrade and rocks a tropical Dom test type in the last episode. Now, the girls are very, very close to Arizona, so they make a blatant rush into enemy territory to recover the Hildorfer wreck. Now, considering this game was pretty much all cake and brownies up to this point, I was really disturbed at how hard this mission summoning was. So, the only way to get out to the Hildorfer resting place is by fighting your way through about 30 GMs, with again your meager MS team consisting of three emotionally unstable teenage girls. The first time I tried this mission, I just got completely murdered by a non-stop army of GMs. The only way I was able to survive this mission was by once again using guerrilla tactics to strategically survive using the terrain. MBU has the high ground. Yes, like that. Anyway, after barely surviving the GMs and locating the Hildorfer ruin, a fat uncle lift unit comes down and begins salvaging it. So you have to defend the fat uncle, which is actually really easy because it's only being attacked by gun tanks and they come out to shoot it down, but they parade out at a pretty easy slow pace. But then everything goes completely wrong because crazy end game boss, crazy bitch Lilith and her gun and pixie come out to play and they're the final boss of the game. Now this is unfortunately the hardest fight in the game and it's completely crazy because on top of being the hardest fight in the game, her stupid gun and pixie has almost no ranged weapon. It's just scary fast and has deadly melee attacks. One time I thought I could defeat her by getting up on a hill and sniping her to death, but by the time I was close enough to get her in my sights, she instantly rocketed up to me and stabbed me in the face instantly, even though I was on a fucking mountain towering above her. Making matters worse, she has to be dealt with quickly and you can't use the typical guerrilla tactics that this entire game has been cultivating for you to survive these battles, because even if you use guerrilla tactics on her, there's a slow parade of gun tanks heading for the fat uncle, and if you ignore them, then they're just going to blow it up and end the mission. Like a few times I just straight up lost because the gun tanks won. Now in the end, how I finally beat her was just by using super aggressive stun combo tactics with Helena, and we like double teamed her and like bazookaed her into a super, super, super long stun lock, keeping her from attacking us until she died. But even then I barely managed to survive her attack and Helena actually finished her off with the final shot. So at the end of episode five, Code Fairy suddenly has sticks. Alma Zaku has been completely destroyed by the Pixie Gundam. Alma is so devastated by this defeat that she goes into a coma. Also, it's shown that while she's in the coma, she's a new type. Now, I have no idea where the story is going to go from there, but there is a final big twist at the end of this game. So the whole game, there's been this bitter old lady narrating the story, and I wasn't paying that much attention at first, so I thought it was Killy, but I actually paid attention for the last one, and I found out that it's actually a much older and wiser Alma who barely survived the one-year war, and in her voice, she sounds oh, so old, so full of despair, and just kind of, that clues me in that she will survive the war, but she is going to suffer psychologically, and I have no idea what's going to happen to anyone else. So yeah, so far Code Fairy has me very, very in. Now, there's a bunch of cool post-game content too, I just haven't gone around checking it out. I guess that's the next thing on my plate. So far it just looks like a bunch of extra missions where you don't play as Alma, but that is the main thing I wanted to do, so I'm actually really looking forward to doing that like tomorrow. What is your final rating? So, I really want to give Code Fairy a rating. I can't judge it fairly because it's not the whole game, it's just the first five episodes. But for those first five episodes, I'm definitely going to say 7 out of 10. Pros, it's a crazy anime video game hybrid product that has never existed before. It fully combines the experience of watching a Gundam anime with the experience of playing a Gundam video game in between the anime. On top of that, it has an incredible synergy with GBO2. That's just, again, something I haven't really taken advantage of. And lastly, all the girls are top tier waifus. They're super adorable. You fall in love with all of them. Now, 
cons, the first three missions are just tutorials. The only hard mission is mission five, where all of a sudden, like, you go from a cakewalk to being in the middle of a burning, raging fire. And also, so far, there is a very much lack of customization in this game. The only thing that you can really control in this game is your tactics, and that's really all you have in hand. Like, if you can keep Mia and Helena alive, you're going to win. If they die, you're going to die. So I think the next pack of episodes is coming out later this month. The episodic nature of the game really makes it great for people who don't want to play a game all day. That was actually one of the coolest things about this game for me because I just played it like one episode a day at the end of my day. And I really, really enjoyed doing it like that. Alright, so that's my first review for Code Fury. If you guys want another review when Volume 2 comes out, let me know. I will be happy to continue on because I'm actually really into the story now that Episode 5 like made it like so hardcore. Alright, so I'm Mubus Green. I love Gundam. Come back next time, you guys. I'm sure I've got more stuff for you. Alright, thank you. Please subscribe. I only need 280 subscribers. And then I'll be monetized, which is good. Alright, bye. Please subscribe. Please subscribe.